Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this uh, Wednesday night Bible study for the Church of the Eternally Secure. Uh, I have with me uh, Sister Renee Rowland, and uh, we've been doing this now for, uh, I think this is our sixth Wednesday night Bible study now. If you did not see the first five, uh, they are uploaded and available on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher, under the playlist title, uh, Wednesday uh, Bible Studies. Um, we just finished the, doing a study on the sermon by uh, Charles Spurgeon. Uh, uh, his sermon was titled Warrant of Faith. Uh, if you did not see it, I hope you go back and watch that because I think Renee and I have come, both come to the conclusion that it's one of the greatest sermons ever. It's just for pure grace with un pure, unadulterated grace, not allowing for anything else. He just defends that, that truth um, as well as anybody I've ever heard. Uh, but now we're going to move on to the antithesis of this whole idea <laughs> and talk about um, certainly one of the most famous sermons, uh, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God by Jonathan Edwards, uh, written, I think, around 1790-something. And uh, I was trying to figure out if it was the 1700s or the 1600s. I knew it was Puritan. Yeah, it's. Uh, let me see. I did put that on the description of the – let me see if I can see it here. 17 something. Yeah, it was uh, seven, July 8th, 1741. Wow. Enfield, Enfield, Connecticut is where he preached this sermon. Yeah. Um, so we're going to go through this just like we did the, uh, the, the last sermon uh, and just read it and react to it. Yeah, but I, I, I'm pretty um, um, Mm, pessimistic about how we're going to uh, interpret this, but maybe not. I, I've never read it. I, I just heard a little bit about it, but just the title itself <laughs> makes me think I probably I'm going to uh, not like much of it. Okay, sister, anything you want to say before we get started? No, I'm just so happy to be here tonight, and thank you guys for showing up. I'm interested in hearing your comments. So please comment with your thoughts. Uh, yeah, yeah, thank you for everybody in the chat room. Uh, as we're going through this, uh, if you have any questions as we're going through or give us your thoughts, but please, uh, you know, the chat room is very tempting for each pe person in there to start uh, side discussions on other things. But this is a Bible study on this particular subject, so I hope everybody will stay focused. Stay with us on this subject, and we'd like your interaction as we go through this. Okay, so I'll read just a little bit and then uh, get your thoughts. Okay, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God by Jonathan Edwards. <clears throat> Their foot shall slide in due time. Deuteronomy, I don't know, that is that 32? 32, 35. 30, yeah, I noticed that he, the, uh, in this particular uh, uh, text of this, uh, he has Rome, they're using Roman numerals showing us the chapters. So uh, some of these Roman numerals he's going to cite. I don't, I don't know Roman numerals well enough to tell you what it is. But this one I think is 32, verse 35. That's their foot shall slide in due time. And he says in this verse is threatened the vengeance of God on the wicked, unbelieving Israelites who were God's visible people and who lived under the means of grace. Oh, God, I'm, I'm surprised to see that there. And that, yeah, me too. Yeah, and that's, uh, that's good so far. He, he, he recognizes that. But who, notwithstanding, all God's wonderful works toward them remained, uh, he says, pointing to verse 28, void of counsel, having no understanding in them, under all the cultivations of heaven, they brought forth bitter and poisonous fruit, as in the two verses next preceding the text. The expression I have chosen for my text, their foot shall slide in due time, seems to imply the following doings relating to the punishment and destruction to which these wicked Israelites were exposed, that they were always exposed to, to destruction. Uh, as one stands or walks in slippery places, is always exposed to fall. Well, let me let me stop there and just get your your thoughts on that so far. 
Uh, oh, all, all it seems to be saying is that uh, it's, I'm surprised also they acknowledge that even though they were given the law, they were under grace until the law it was completely God's grace. Um, and they had seen ridiculous uh, manifestations of God physically, you know, with the pillar of cloud and, and parting the Red Sea and the pillar of fire by night and still in unbelief. So, uh, see, it's interesting to start a sermon with their foot shall slide in due time. <laughs> kind of gives you the context of where he's coming from, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah I, I believe he's going to relate this to contemporary times, uh, but uh, he, right now he's talking about this group of Israelites at that time in history. Uh, but uh, the idea that he uses the word grace uh, right off the bat, that is encouraging, but uh, we'll see how he... Uh, you know, really applies that grace. And uh, I want everybody to know that um, this idea of, that you, you said, uh, until the law was established with, between God and, and Moses, it was only grace. And, and then when the law came into play, uh, here's where the common mistake is among most of the church today. They, they believe the law was instituted uh, as a, a means of earning our salvation. This is where people are, are really uh, have a damnable heresy, and it's uh, going to cost them their salvation if they don't get that right. Blessing and cursing of the nation. Yeah, exactly. The, I, I, the other day in, in a, one of Matthias's uh, talks, um, I was pointing out to somebody who was trying to uh, promote dispensationalism, and I said, let's look at the Old Testament, and I showed some verses that say, okay, in the future, when people ask you what was the purpose of the law being established, tell them this. <laughs> you know, it's like it's right, right directly to us. You want to know what, in, in, here, thousands of years in the future, they're going to be asking, what is this law? What's the point of all that? Well, tell them this. And they said, it's so that people, the Israelites will be blessed and not die. So that was the purpose of the law. And then it also served another purpose, as we found out from Jesus and Paul, and that is to make us uh, convict us of our sin and guilt to make our, us understand our need for the Savior. So the offense might abound. Yeah. So there, there never has been in the past. There isn't here now in the present or there and there will not be in the future any law or legalism that is a source of salvation. That's the important for pe people to understand. Jonathan Edwards seems to like to put the prefix of wicked before he says Israelite every time. <laughs> every time. Yeah, well, maybe let's see if he's one of those people that we're, you're talking about before we started that has this yeah. animosity towards uh, Israel. Uh, okay, um, let me see. Uh, this is implied. Do you want to read from that point, sister? All right, hold on. I got to go back up because I... All right. This is implied in the manner of their destruction coming upon coming upon them, being represented by their foot sliding, the same as expressed in Psalms 123, 18. Surely thou didst set them in slippery places. Thou casted them down unto destruction. It implies that they were always exposed to sudden unexpected destruction. As he walks in slippery places, is every moment liable to fall. He cannot foresee one moment whether he shall stand or fall the next. And when he does fall, he falls at once without warning, which is also expressed in Psalm. I just went down the page. Hold on one second. Also expressed in Psalms 1, 23, 18, and 19. Surely thou didst set them in slippery places, thou cast them down into destruction. How art they brought down into desolation as in a moment? Another thing implied is that they are liable to fall of themselves without being thrown down by the hand of another. As he that stands or walks on slippery ground needs nothing but his own weight to throw him down. That the reason why they are not fallen already and do not fall now is only that God's appointed time is not come. For it is said that when in due time or appointed time comes, their foot shall slide, then shall be left to fall as they are inclined by their own. Hold on. 
uh, by their own weight. So it seems like he's saying that it's not God that's going to do it, but they are surely going to fall. There, it's not when, it's not if, it's when. At any moment they can fall and it's under their own weight. It's not anybody doing it to them but themselves. That's what he's saying. It mm -hmm. seems to be anyway. Well, there's a, there's a, I doubt anybody can go through life without falling. Let's just say falling, I believe, is talking about you're just going, your life is going into ruin. You're going, your 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 life is being turned upside down. You have some horrible disaster, whether it's health or poverty or war or famine or something. Something bad is going to happen to us. Now, no one gets born and lives very long without having these ups and downs, uh, and so it is inevitable. But is God causing it? Well, we know that God does cause sometimes bad things to happen. Uh, we, we, there's plenty of uh, records and scriptures where God did make bad things happen to people, uh, to groups of people. Um, but uh, there's the point he's making here is that uh, because of their own decisions and their own choices, they will uh, slip and fall. Uh, and it's not, in this case, he's saying it's not because of God, it's only because of or at least partly because of uh, their own uh, bad choices. And Luke, you know how we're always saying the Bible is a discerner of hearts and mm -hmm. those that have a view of God, some wrathful, like we're still under some condemnation. They always see the negative in scripture. RL wrote something funny. The Lord is my prankster. He makes me to fall down in slippery pastures. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good. We, we see, you know, it just shows how, people see God. It really does tell you how people see God as a loving father or as a taskmaster ready, waiting for you to fall down so he can beat you, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That also, uh, it makes me think of this idea that I think we were talking about this the other night too with Matthias. Huh? Uh, I had to dissent uh, when it comes to the, uh, the teaching, the, the understanding and teaching on this word, uh, chastise that we find in, in Hebrews. Uh, I, I have grown, moved away from the idea that God is chastising it like giving us his, his children a spanking. Me too. Yeah, I, I, I think that it's basically, um, I think the illustration that we use that I, that I think is the right way to understand this is it, it, it's prodding. It's like you you have a prodder and you try to steer your sheep or your cattle in a certain right. direction and you, you, you're, you're prodding them, but you're not beating them. You're, no. So does God purposely make people get sick? No. Does God, does God purposely make bad things happen to people as a, because they somehow they got out of a line spiritually and he has to chastise them? Uh, I don't think that's the type, that's what chastisement means. I don't think God is certainly, especially the, his children, but anyway, now a door can be open. A door can be open where Satan does it, but God's not doing it. Yeah. Yes. It okay. tells us that to go. You know, that Satan was behind all the tragedy. Yeah. Yeah, I did a verse by verse teaching on Job, and uh, that was one of the most enjoyable studies I've, I've ever taught. Uh, uh, really, I it, I was confused for many many years about Job, uh, but. I don't want to get sidetracked in that. If, yeah. if well, it says God, it, that Job did not sin because he didn't blame God for the calamity. Yeah, you know, the idea was that he uh, he's the best person in the world. Yep. That's what the scriptures were saying about him. He's the very best person in the world. So, uh, but Satan said, well, even your very best person, uh, you know, they only love you because you're good to them. Let, uh, let me do be, be, treat them wrong and see how they turn against you. And that was the, what was the test was all about. But uh, yeah, watch my uh, playlist uh, on, on the book of Job, verse by verse. Uh, I, I think everybody will, I think it's important to understand that book. Yeah, Come it's on. a hard book if you don't. Okay, let me read a little further. It says, uh, uh, God will not hold them up in these slippery places any longer but we'll let them go. And then at very that very instant, they shall fall into destruction as he, sta as he that stands on such slippery declining ground on the edge of a pit. He cannot stand alone 
when he is let go, he immediately falls and is lost. The observation from the words that I would now insist upon is this, quote, there is nothing that keeps wicked men at any moment out of hell but the mere pleasure of God, unquote. I don't know what he's quoting there, though. He's not giving us the source. By the mere pleasure of God, I mean his sovereign pleasure, his arbitrary will, restrained by no obligation, hindered by no manner of difficulty, any more than if nothing else but God's mere will had in the least decree or in any respect whatsoever any hand in the preservation of wicked men one moment. The truth of this observation may appear by the following considerations. There is no want of power in God to cast wicked men into hell at any moment. Men's hands cannot be strong when God rises up. The strongest have no power to resist him, nor can any deliver out of his hands. He is not only able to cast wicked men into hell, but he can most easily do it. Sometimes an earthly prince meets with a great deal of difficulty subdue, to subdue a rebel who has found means to fortify himself and has made himself strong by the numbers of his followers, but it is not so with God. There is no fortress that is in any defense from the power of God. Though hand join in hand and cast multitudes of God's enemies combine and associate themselves, they are easily broken in pieces. They are as great heaps of light chaff before the whirlwind or large quantities of dry stubble before devouring flames. Uh, we find, yeah, go ahead. We find it easy to tread on and crush a, a worm that we see crawling on the earth. So it is easy for us to cut or singe a slender thread that anything hangs by. Thus, easy is it for God when he pleases to cast his enemies down to hell. I'll stop. I'll stop there. Wow. At first I thought he was going somewhere good, Luke, like saying, you know, all men would eventually through their own deceitfulness of their heart and sin would just send themselves to hell. And that it, it's easy for God to just give us that judgment, but it's his own love, grace and character that keeps us out of hell. And I thought that he was really going there. But then when he says, uh, uh, that it, ple it that it's easy for God when he pleases to cast his enemies down to hell. It's almost like he's acting like God does take pleasure in destroying his enemies. But it says that he does not uh, he does not take pleasure in the perishing of the wicked. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the uh, the portion of there that got my uh, attention. Uh, was when he was talking, mentioned the word sovereignty. And let me see if I can find that again. Yeah, okay. Let me read that back. It says, um, there is nothing that keeps wicked men at any one moment out of hell, but the mere pleasure of God. By the mere pleasure of God, I mean his sovereign pleasure, his arbitrary will. See, this uh, certainly sounds like Calvinism to me. I don't really know if he's a Calvinist, but this this is uh, something that a Calvinist would say. And uh, the idea that God, out of what? Let me see the word that he um, he used again. Arbitrary is the word that bothered me. Um, it says. Yeah, it says, um, I mean his sovereign pleasure, his arbitrary will, restrained by no obligation. So, of course, what's the problem with Calvinism? I mean, you, you know, you and I haven't really, uh, uh, together, done any uh, study or discussions that are just the two of us on Calvinism. But I, I did a, I have a playlist that's very quite thorough and exhaustive that's refuting every tenet of Calvinism. And I despise everything about Calvinism, but this is one of the things that really sickens me about, about it, is the, the, the teaching that God is just arbitrary and that just, you know, he gets some kind of a pleasure out of just arbitrarily doing, causing bad things to happen to people. Right, some people are just born for destruction. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. and it says that he takes no pleasure 
in the perishing of the wicked. So I don't know why people get this. It's like he's a God of justice, but he did everything to prevent us having to bear that judgment. So I don't know why people think that. Uh, it, uh, do you have your camera off on purpose right now? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's uh, the idea of that. Um, the, the, most people are familiar with TULIP. It's an acronym, T-U-L-I-P. I uh, hate it. This is a way of expressing the five basic tenets of Calvinism, but there's a, there's a six, and I, I would call it the foundational point that Tulip sits on, and, and that's another point that is, uh, you know, from hell. It's, and that is the idea that um, God is, exercises his sovereignty to the extent that we don't even have a free will. Uh, we don't have any of our own thoughts. God controls every thought, word, and deed of all people, all of his creation. And his sovereignty is too overdone. They overdo yeah. his sovereignty. Well, it, it's, 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 you know, hyper, hyper sovereignty. They take sovereignty to such an extreme that they turn God into an evil, uh, uh, sadistic, cosmic uh, sadist. It's, uh, um, and the problem with that is that if God really controlled every word, thought, and deed of every person, and then we go to the judgment, we have every right with real justice to plead to God, I'm completely innocent because you controlled me like a puppet. You told you me told you didn't make me to believe. Yes. You never let me believe. Yes. Every sin I ever did... <laughs> You you dreamed it up and you made me do it like you're controlling a puppet. It wasn't me doing it. Yep. It's like it's like uh, the idea of a gun. Okay, is it the gun? Uh, guns don't kill people. It's the person holding and pointing and shooting the gun. So what God do, is doing in Calvinism is He's turning us us into the weapon or up, us into the evil instrument. But He's the one that's pulling the trigger and pointing it. And so He is making us sin. And therefore, at the judgment, we can say to God, I'm innocent. I'm just an innocent puppet. You're the guilty party because you've made me do all these sins. Even yeah, Satan could claim that to make that I argument to God. Is a and terrible it, assault on the character of God. Yeah. So uh, the way that um, uh, he is expressing it here, uh, again, I don't know if he's a Calvinist. Maybe as we go along, there'll be more of us. But I don't like the sound of that. I mean his sovereign pleasure, his arbitrary. Yeah, yeah. yeah another point of, of Calvinism is the fact that everything is arbitrary. God's not a respecter of persons. Therefore, whether he chooses you for heaven or chooses you for hell, it's just arbitrary, like rolling the dice, you know. This right. person saved, this person's not. Except every Calvinist claims they're one of the elect. So <laughs> you'll never hear him say, I'm a Calvinist, but too bad I wasn't chosen. No, it's always those that think, and they claim it's unconditional, but you know they think there's something in them that made them get chosen. You know it. It's prideful. But the way they get around saying that God's, they've turned him into an evil God for doing this, is they'll claim that all men deserve hell. So if God saves any, he's good. And that that doesn't do it for me. That's not enough to, to make that work on his character at all. And I was going to ask you if Edwards was a Calvinist, because I can't tell. Yeah. All right. Where did we end? Yeah. Well, let me see. Uh, uh, we are. Oh, uh, what we are? Let me let me let me find my place again. Uh, men's hands cannot straw rise up. Uh, oh, I forgot to mark my. What spot. are we? I think it's right after it says "cast down to hell." Okay, I'll go ahead and start start reading. I'll find the point where you are. What are we that we should think to stand before him at whose whose rebuke? Hold on, I keep my cursor keeps going down. Whose rebuke the earth trembles, and before whom the rocks are thrown down? They deserve to be cast into hell. See, it sounds like a Calvinist here. So that divine justice never stands in the way. It makes no objection against God's using His power at any moment to destroy them. Yea, on the contrary. Justice calls aloud for an infinite punishment for their sins. Divine justice says of the tree that brings forth such grapes of Sodom, cut it down, why cumbereth it to the ground? Luke uh, 13, 7. 
The sword of divine justice is every moment brandished over their heads. And it is nothing but the hand of arbitrary mercy and God's mere will that holds it back. That sounds like Calvinism to me. Yeah. It sure does. Hold on. I'll, I'll continue. I just lost it again. Why does it keep doing that? They are already under a sentence of condemnation to hell. They do not only justly deserve to be cast down thither, but the sentence of the law of God, that eternal and immutable rule of righteousness that gone, God has fixed between him and mankind is gone out against them. So he's acting like God has uh, put a, a fix between us, a chasm. A uh, fix between him and mankind has gone out against them and stands against them. So they are bound already over to hell. John 3. He that believeth not is condemned already. So if you notice, he didn't put the first part, the good news. He that believeth is not condemned. So that every unconverted man properly belongs to hell. That is his place. From thence he is, John 8, 23. Ye are from, no, yeah, 8, 23. Ye are from beneath, and thither be is bound. It is the place that justice and God's word and the sentence of his unchangeable law assigns to him, uh, let's see, they are now the objects of that very same anger and wrath of God that is expressed in the torments of hell. And the reason why they do not go down to hell at each moment is not because of God, but is not because God in whose power they are is not then very angry with them as he is with many miserable creatures now tormented in hell who there feel and bear the fierceness of his wrath. Yea, God is a deal more angry with great numbers that are now on earth. Yea, doubtless. Where is the good news here? With many that are now in his con this congregation, who it may be are at ease, than he is with many of those who are now in the flames of hell. So it's not because God is unmindful of their wickedness and does not resent it, that he does not let loose his hand and cut them off. So, it, uh, you know, isn't it the goodness of God that leads men to repentance? Mm -hmm. I mean, th this here just makes it sound like he's waiting. He has the power and at any minute he's going to cast those unbelief. But in the Bible, it says that he gives chance after chance after chance. Mm -hmm. When it says that, do we know that he didn't use those vessels of dishonor and give them patience and chance and chance, uh, you know, because he wants them saved. He doesn't say anything about wanting them saved or commending his love toward us because he loved the world so much that he sent his son. This is more like you all deserve hell and God's going to send you there. So you better, but you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. better, you know, it's just, I mean, I think you really, really get through to people when you let them know the love of God, the love of God is the message that Jesus brought of a loving father that reconciles us to him. Yeah. The, uh, earlier on he's saying that the only thing that is keeping people from falling right into hell is God's holding you and he could just arbitrarily decide just to let let go of you and drop you into hell or anytime he wants and he has the sovereign right to do it and he could just arbitrarily just let go of you and let you fall right into hell uh, yeah it's uh, there are people that I've talked to who um, they came to believe out of fear uh, because, because they heard something like this and they were so afraid of going to hell that that fear drove them or, or they, they ran to the, the, the cross and there are pr people who probably legitimately got saved out of fear. It says uh, save some with the fear of the fire. It says that save some with the mm -hmm. fear of the fire. Yeah. Uh, my experience, and we know that every every believer is a, uh, uh, our conversion experience is unique to us. And after we're saved, our uh, our walk and our growth spiritually is unique. We cannot have a uh, a uh, let's say a uh, a list of steps where okay yeah. to get saved, you, like we did with. Uh, Spurgeon's sermon. He says, "Experiential standards." Yeah, there are no, there's no other warrant. There's no other preconditions. Like you got to have tears, you got to have contrition, you got to have repentance, you got to have this and that before you can get saved. 
And these are the things, the steps you process, you've got to go through to get saved. And then after you get saved, then the way you're supposed to conduct your life afterwards and behave, this is all standard. Everybody is the same. No, that's that's wrong. We're all unique. And my experience, Mike, of conversion, it, it, it was completely different than this. That never would have brought me. I'll tell you what happened to me when I was young, young boy. I was taken to a church uh, uh, in, uh, in Texas. Uh, we were on a vacation there. And my dad took me there. And um, it was some kind of a church I wasn't familiar with because I had only gone to a Catholic church as a, as a child. Um, but they preached the sermon. They did an altar call. And no one came forward. And then the pastor's whole demeanor and voice changed. He got vi visibly angry and said, I know there's lost people here today and you didn't come forward. So I pray the, the rest of today is the worst day of your life. Nice. Uh, you know, I was a young boy, but I, I was uh, at least had enough sense, even at that age, to recognize that if this is what Christianity is, I don't want to have anything to do with this. That turned me away from the Bible and yep. Jesus. And uh, yep. for, for many, many years, I, I was uh, didn't want to have anything to do with it. But when I finally did get saved, it, as I read the Gospel of John, when I understood that it says that there's no greater love than giving your life for your friend. And he loved us so much, he was willing to die for us. And that uh, we love him because he first loved us. That's the experience I had. I loved Jesus when I understood that's how much he loved me. And it was the love of God that, that made drew me to Christ for my conversion, not the fear of, of hell. Uh, yeah, uh, you know, preaching this way because the law is the strength of sin, right? So the more you preach God's anger and wrath, the more people walk away from him and get rebellious and angry at God. And the thing is, my, my son's aunt went to a church and told her if she didn't stop listening to rock and roll, stop drinking, stop going to clubs. She was going to hell. Her and her friend both left, said, I don't want no part of this. I'm not ready to change my life. It was just crazy because he was preaching law for salvation instead of coming to Christ as he is. But it's a lot harder to get someone to understand God's holiness and their own depravity than it is to let them know God's love. Because what you have to do if you're preaching the flames is to first convince them that God is so holy. And then you have to convince them why they're not. And then you have to convince them why it's righteous anger that God has and why you deserve hell. You know, so it's a, it's it's goodness of God that leads men to repentance. This kind of way doesn't do anything. But uh, one of the viewers in here sent me something a long time ago and said it was this kind of preaching that kept him as an atheist. You know, and you listen to Christopher Hitchens and Dawkins, they're resentful at God tells you, you got to keep all these laws or you're going to go to hell. If he forces you to worship him or go to hell, you know, they're angry at this and they refuse to hear anything else about it. So I just think this is not a good way to go. Yeah, I, it's, it's true that uh, um, the teaching that God is going to torture the lost people forever in hell uh it is one of the biggest barriers uh, the atheists um, and, and anti-Christians. Uh, that's one of the biggest barriers for them. They, they, they've said many times to me, I could never believe in a God like that. And that's one of the reasons, one of the primary reasons that I believe that uh, um, the idea of eternal torment in hell or eternally being tortured in, in hell is not biblical. I've got a playlist on that. Uh, titled uh, first century church didn't believe it because they knew hell was a different place than the lake of fire they knew eventually hell would be thrown and destroyed in the lake of fire yeah. but the catholic church and augustine brought in all of that yeah uh, but the uh, uh when i uh, it took about a year for a friend of mine to to um, pull me away from the tr traditional majority viewpoint on this uh, I didn't. I didn't change my mind easily, but uh, the scriptures. As I took a look at it, I realized that the scriptures teach otherwise. Uh, if anybody wants to consider this, you can go to my playlist. Uh, what is the state of the dead? And you can see the reasons that uh, I believe that God is not torturing people um, forever and ever and ever the way that most people believe and teach, but. The lost will perish. I mean, the most famous verse in the Bible is John three sixteen, and it tells you there's two 
possibilities. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So you have two possibilities for every person. You can have everlasting life, and you get that by putting your faith completely in Jesus for your salvation. Or if you fail to receive this gift of eternal life, you will perish. And uh, the, the Bible says that uh, we, we don't fear those who can only destroy your body, but fear those God who can destroy both body and soul. So I believe that this body and soul are destroyed and perish in the lake of fire. And that's what the Bible calls the second death. And death is destroyed. At some point, death itself is destroyed. Yes. Um, so that's not what this uh, this uh, study here tonight is, is really all about. But if a person is um, wants to know more about why I reject that now, go to my playlist, What is the State of the Dead, and consider it. You don't have to change your mind as I did, uh, but at least open up your mind and consider the possibility that maybe God is not some cruel, sadistic torturer that wants to you know torment people forever and ever, but instead... They suffer the second death. They die, and and body and soul, and they perish. Um, but uh, getting, let's get back to the, the sermon here. Um, uh, you read last, I think. I so I, I'll start here. God is not altogether. You see where I am, God. God. Okay, God is not altogether such and one as themselves, though they may imagine him to be so. The wrath of God burns against them. Their damnation does not slumber. The pit is prepared. The fire is made ready. The furnace is now hot, ready to receive them. The flames do now rage and glow. The glittering sword is wet and held over them, and the pit hath opened its mouth under them. The devil stands ready to fall upon them and seize them as his own. At what moment God shall permit him? They belong to him. He has their souls in his possession and under his dominion. The scriptures represents them as his goods. Luke 11, verse 12, he cites. The devils watch them. They are ever by them at their right hand. They stand waiting for them like greedy, hungry lions that see their prey and expect to have it, but are for the present kept back. If God should withdraw his hand by which they are restrained, they would in one moment fly upon their poor souls. The old serpent is gaping for them. Hell opens its mouth wide to receive them. And if God should permit it, they would be hastily swallowed up and lost. Wow. Okay, I'm going to stop there. I got to get your thoughts right. on that. Oh, man. First of all, the devil is not in hell. He's the prince of the power of the air, and he's roaming to and fro on the earth, seeking whom he may devour. But in any case, it, this would convert no one. And it reminds me of the story of when back then they didn't have horror movies. But they loved a good fright. And they would go to these sermons to hear all the gory details of which sinner is getting what kind of torture. You know, and, and it's just sickening because it's based more on paganistic ideas of hell uh, and Dante's Inferno and the Enid rather than scripture you know it's just uh, as far as i can see in scripture forever and ever is translated from the word eon and hell is not the lake of fire it seems like hell is a place of torment until they're completely destroyed at the judgment of god and thrown into the lake of fire but they perish they're destroyed from what i can see in scripture and looking at the first century church and what their beliefs were until Catholics came around, like Augustine, they all believed. Some either believed that ultimately all men would be reconciled to God through some process, or they believed that eventually that when hell is thrown into the lake of fire, that they perish, they are destroyed. We're not, I'm not saying like Jehovah's Witnesses that think you sleep and then you just don't exist. That's not what we're saying. Scripture clearly says this. Now, I can't say for sure. That's why I don't do videos on the doctrine of hell. I just preach that we are saved from it, regardless of what it is, because I'm not here to fight about what hell is. I'm not there. I'm not going there. And I don't want anyone else to. 
But this guy, I mean, I, he, I don't see how he could save anyone's soul with this. All this would do is scare somebody into thinking they better live better before they, before they can be saved. Doesn't it sound like it? Yeah. Are you scared yeah. them to straighten yeah. it up? You know, uh, as I read it, I try to read it dramatically and it uh, really, I'm, as I'm reading, I'm thinking, well, this is really something the way he's expressing it. It is really frightening and scary. But uh, the problem is there's nothing in that last portion I read that's actually in the Bible. <laughs> nothing doesn't say that we belong to the devil and we're his to and they're, they're waiting to the demons are all there waiting to torture us that is exactly uh, the representation we do find in dante's inferno as you cited i read dante's inferno it was very fun to read it but it's so far from the bible it's amazing but these ideas are extra biblical they're not from the Bible. They're from other theologians uh, and other yeah. other uh, non-biblical writings like Dante's Inferno. Yeah, Augustine also got his idea of the soul being immortal from uh, Plato and Greek philosophers. Mm -hmm. Not the Bible. Yeah, the idea that uh, we uh, we do not get tortured forever, but we are destroyed and perish is one portion of this but the other part of this this position is the fact that um most people not just uh in christianity but uh, everybody around the world that it's almost universal belief that somehow after we die everybody actually lives forever we are uh, the human soul is immortal and and some people believe well it has to come back in another body through reincarnation the uh, bible people, says that he's immortal only that god is only immortal yes but if the, if you believe that everybody has an immortal soul then what happens after you die well it either has to come back and live again in another body the way the reincarnation in buddhism and hinduism teaches and new age religions uh, or or you have to believe that well it, it you lived you're going to live either forever in heaven or you're going to live forever in hell. But the Bible has not one single verse that explicitly states or even alludes to the fact that every person is born in, in, inherently with a, an immortal soul. No. Matter of fact, it says that man's life is short. He is but dust. The spirit returns to God. Only God is immortal. It says all of that stuff. It says that God can destroy the both body and soul. And so uh, apparently eternal life is still eternal life. You're just eternal life in torment. But we only have immortality through Christ. Yes. So the, the idea about um, man's uh, immortality uh, is, uh, is one of the biggest problems. The assumption that everybody is naturally, innately immortal is wrong. Uh, the Bible does not state that it's immortal. In fact, it it. it explicitly says that we are mortal and we must put on immortality by faith in Jesus so we can be immortal if we put our faith in Jesus but without that we don't have naturally immortality so the, these things are like go hand in hand the idea that immortality is conditional conditioned upon believing in Jesus if you don't if you don't feel fit uh, have that condition faith in Jesus then you don't have immortality. And, uh, and then, of course, if you don't have immortality, you can't live forever in, in hell. You're destroyed because you're, you're immortal. You, you can't live forever. Um, but the, uh, this, this reading there, even though it's dramatic, it's just not biblical. I mean, we do have a few verses that people like to cite to try to prove uh, eternal torment. There's a couple of verses that they use that we can explain, but uh, there's a... Uh, there's nothing in the Bible that goes, it seems to me that um, some people want to make the idea of eternal torment for the lost is uh, so important. It's actually an essential doctrine of Christianity. I know I've been called heretic because I've said I can't say for sure, but it leans more toward the destruction of the wicked eventually. Yeah. Than well, I'm, I'm absolutely convinced that God is not sadistically torturing the lost forever and ever. I'm convinced of that. But the point is, um, if um, 
it really argues against the, the, the character and nature of the God that I know from, from the Bible. Um, I forgot what I was going to say, but. But it's still good to look at like the very first century after the apostles to mm -hmm. see what they believed. And they all believed eventually one of two things, either all would be reconciled after something, some kind of hell or something. And, or, but most believed that the wicked would be destroyed because hell itself is thrown into the lake of fire. Most people think hell and the lake of fire are the same place. They're not, you know, so. I don't know why people need that to be something you absolutely agree on. If we're all saying, look, it, the, the, the punishment for not receiving Christ is horrible and Jesus died to save you from it, that I don't know why that's not enough. Yeah. Okay, do you want to pick up at the next point and read, read the yeah. next portion? Is it, uh, these are in the souls of wicked men, is that it? Yes. There are in the... In the souls of wicked men, those hellish principles reigning that would <coughs> presently kindle the flame out into hellfire if it were not for God's restraints. Oh, he's trying to make him good. It's kind of hard to do after you've done all that. There is laid in the very nature of carnal men a foundation for the torments of hell. There are those, golly, why does it keep going all the way down the next page? There are those corrupt principles and reigning power in them in full possession of them that are seeds of hellfire. These principles are active and powerful, exceeding violent in their nature. And if it were not for the restraining hand of God upon them, they would soon break out. They would flame out after the same manner and the same corruptions, the same enmity does in the hearts of damned souls and would beget the same torments as they do in them. The souls of the wicked are in scripture compared to the troubled sea. Isaiah 1... 07 20 for the present god restrains their wickedness by his mighty power as he does the raging waves of the troubled sea saying quote hitherto shalt thou come but no further quote but if god should withdraw that restraining power it would soon carry all before it sin is the ruin and misery of the soul i thought he took our sins as far as the east is from the west and said he would remember them no more it is destructive in its nature that's true, sin, uh, and God wants to keep us from that. And if God should leave it without restraint, there would need nothing else to make the soul perfectly miserable. The corruption of the heart of man is immoderate. I just want to add there, sin is destructive and has its own consequences within itself. And God is trying to keep us from that, even after we're saved, to keep us from the destruction of sin. Uh, the corruption of the heart of man is immoderate and boundless in his fury. And while wicked men live here, it is like fire pent up by God's restraints. Whereas if it were let loose, it would set on fire the course of nature. And as the heart is now a sink of sin, so if sin was not restrained, it would immediately turn. Ah, I did it again. I'm sorry. It would immediately turn into the turn the soul into a fiery oven or a furnace of fire and brimstone. It is no security to wicked men for one moment that there are no visible means of death at hand. It is no security to a natural man that he is now in health and that he does not see which way he should now immediately go out of the world by any accident and that there is no visible danger in any respect to his circumstances. The manifold and continual experience of the world in all ages shows this is no evidence that a man is not on the very brink of eternity and that the next step will not be into another world. The unseen, unthought of ways and means of persons going suddenly out of the world are innumerable and un inconceivable. Unconverted men walk over the pit of hell on a rotten covering, and there are innumerable places in this covering so weak that they will not bear their weight, and these places are not seen. The arrows of death fly unseen at noonday. The sharpest sight cannot discern them. God has so many different unsearchable ways of taking wicked men out of the world and sending them to hell that there is nothing to make it appear that God has need to be at the expense of a miracle or go out of the ordinary course of his providence to destroy any wicked man at any moment. All the means that there are sinners going out to the world are so in God's hand and so universally and absolutely subject to his power and determination that it does not depend at all the less on the mere will of God, whether sinners shall at any moment go to hell. And if it means we're never made use of or without concern in this case, he's basically saying you could die at any minute and God can snatch you out of the world, throw you right into hell. But why isn't he saying that God is long suffering and patient 
and not willing any should perish, but all come to repentance. They, he wants them all to turn to him and believe on his son. And, and he's not waiting for you to fail so that he can find a loophole to throw you into hell at his pleasure. I mean, this is what he's saying. Yeah. Um, the, the amazing thing about this is that his uh, talent uh, in, in writing and communicating is uh, fantastic. He really knows how to express this viewpoint. Uh, it's, it's a shame that that kind of talent is not used to present the gospel and the, the, uh, uh, the love of God instead of the torments of hell. Um, but uh, this is probably, this might be the most famous fire and brimstone sermon ever preached. R.L. was saying he makes it sound like forgiveness is an injustice. <laughs> God to forgive people. Yeah, it's it's almost like there are the, there are a lot of people that um, have contacted me and made little comments uh, uh, regarding my uh, viewpoint against eternal torment uh, and favoring uh, the destruction and perishing of the uh, body and soul. Uh, and they, many people have said they've also come to agree that this is the correct position. But those people who disagree with me on this, who hold the, the more the majority or traditional viewpoint about uh, uh, thinking there is eternal torment for the lost, these people, it seems that they get glee from the thought of the lost people being tortured forever. It seemed like that's really, without that, that they are so offended that that uh, anyone would put forth the idea that God is not going to torture people forever. That it's offends so them so much. They want God to do this. And they all have somebody in mind they think deserves it. But they themselves, of course, don't deserve it, Luke. They don't deserve eternal torment, but those sinners do. It's like they want it to be true. They yeah. want, and, and they, you know, they got a different God than I have. Cause they, they walk, it says there is no more condemnation. God reconciled the world to himself. That his wrath was poured out on Christ. So, I mean, it, it, it makes, it doesn't, it, they don't even have the same God I have. Yeah. Well, there, there is suffering from our sin. Uh, the, the, Jesus suffered for our sin to, to provide salvation and redemption for us. But every sinner in the present tense suffers from their sin. There That's are right. natural consequences. If I go off uh, tonight, Las Vegas is famous for, you know, being sin city. So let's say I go to one of these strip clubs and I, I meet one of these uh, uh, women that are prostitutes and I go have a, uh, sexual relations and then let's say I have you know, a venereal disease and then gave it to my wife and then, then my wife divorces me. And you see, yep. uh, you don't get away no. with your sin. No. Um, uh, even if you want to even take something like just bad habits, like uh, uh, smoking too much, drinking too much, uh, too much food, all these things, that, that these excesses, there's a consequence for that. There's health it's, issues that come that's from That's not it. enough for these people. They want them to be punished more. I'm yeah. like, it's so wicked for them to want other people punished for their sin, but they can't see their own. People yeah. really think sin is just murder and thieving. They, they don't realize it's pride. It's anger. It's speak. It's backbiting and gossip. They, they forget all of that. You know? Your, your sin is sin, but their sin is just mistakes. <laughs> yeah. Well, you ask them, yeah, well, have you completely stopped sinning uh, since you got saved uh, 20 years ago? Oh, I've made some mistakes. <laughs> I know, that's what they say. And I'll go, wait a minute. So you're telling me this guy has to stop that sin or he can't be saved, but you can still have yours? Because yeah. you have to stop sinning. The hypocrisy is unbelievable. Yes. Well, when the Bible says the wages of sin is death, Jesus took our place. So yes, but it still brings physical death too, like you said, Luke. Yes, uh, but the uh, the, uh, the the regarding eternal life, 
having par living forever with joy and bliss and happiness all through eternity, paradise on earth. That's promised to all of us who put our faith in, in Jesus and is offered as a free gift to everyone. Uh, but the, um, the, the sin issue, Jesus took care of that so it's not a barrier for us to get saved. That's but right. Sin still has a, a, an effect on us in our daily lives. If we, if we have sinful lives, you're not going to get away with it. Sin will make you pay for it. People don't believe the gospel, Luke. They don't believe he paid for all our sins. They were all purged and they were all future when, when, when he died. All my sins were future. How can you say the past? It doesn't even make sense to say past sins only. All He purged them all, but they don't believe that. Sin is, like you said, not a barrier. It's been dealt with. It's double jeopardy. I cannot pay for the same sins in eternity that Jesus already bore in his own body. He already paid my penalty. He went to jail for me. I can't go to jail. You know, it's like it doesn't. You can't. It doesn't work like that. They just do not believe the good news. That's why they're not dancing like you. Mm -hmm. yeah. You get up and dance with joy because you know what he did. Yeah. Uh, yeah, if a person, as I've tried to make that point over and over again, is that if a person really truly understands what happens with, with our, our gift of eternal life, uh, they, they should be in the most joyful moment of their life. And if they ponder it each day, they'll stay in this state of, of joy, uh, wow. knowing that uh, the promises Jesus has made for them. Um, now, Celine, I noticed that she asked him, since I mentioned Sin City, if I live here. Yeah, I live in Las Vegas. I was born and raised here in Las Vegas, Celine. Um, so uh, that, that's why my channel is called Sin City Preacher. I'm a preacher. I live in Sin City, Las Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you, want me to, uh, you want me to start reading when you're done at eight? Uh, yeah, go ahead. No, you go ahead and finish. I just wanted to know what. If I, I was okay, well, I, I, the point I wanted to make a kind of a grievance, a grievance is, uh, I'll express is that there are some people that are appalled that I would teach that there's no eternal torment for the lost. They just are, perish and no longer exist. Uh, but my perspective is that how could they demand and require and even be happy and seem to have delight and glee with the idea that God's going to torture people forever. And if, if you don't have that, I don't even want to be a Christian because if you don't have God torturing people, why even be a Christian is the, is the impression yep. I get from them. And it's tradition too, Luke. They've been taught that in their churches. And those two verses translate it forever and ever. They don't realize that it was originally eon. It means an age. So they, yeah. that's the only two verses that even imply that every place else says they're destroyed. They no longer exist. They perish. Yeah. Hell is thrown in. Death is destroyed. But yeah. instead of taking the full counsel of God, I've even said, I'm leaning this way. And here's why I'll show you in the Old Testament and New Testament, the full counsel of God, not just one or two verses, but the full counsel. And there's a lot of colorful idioms that were used back then that people are taking literally and not understanding, like where the worm dieth not. It means death. It means the grave, you know. So uh, it, it's it's just an idiom for permanent death. Yeah. And so they really hang on to, to their traditions. And I had to open my mind up and ask God to show me the truth of his word the way it is in the full counsel of it. And I still cannot say 100%, but I really, really am leaning to they, they go to hell for uh, whatever period, that thousand years, they are not risen again. And then at the judgment seat, hell itself and they are cast into the lake of fire and are no more. They are put to naught. So that is where what I'm leaning towards. But it's only because I really did study. I didn't just accept. I was not going to accept any tradition blindly. Some of the traditions were right, but I had to see it for myself in scripture. And I'm condemned for being a Berean and checking scripture against tradition. You know, because I, I know God doesn't contradict himself. So I wanted to see why all these verses say they perish, they're destroyed. But these two say forever and ever. Where yeah. in the smoke of their torment, 
it tells us exactly what the fire is in Jude. And it clears it up. It says the same fire that destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah is a picture of hellfire. Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed by eternal fire and the smoke of their torment rises forever. Are they still burning? No. It means that the fire came an eternal source because God's an all-consuming fire. It came from an eternal source, not a natural source. And it's permanent. It's permanent. Yeah. So there's only really one verse says forever and ever which is just translated for me on so that that i have more evidence for the destruction than i do for torture forever but they're not without torment yeah. it's clear there is a, a time of torment uh before they're judged at the judgment seat to me i believe that but the the what most people don't realize is that for every verse that someone uses to support eternal torment uh i can provide 50 or a hundred verses that are against that concept. So if a person really decides that, hey, let me really take a be fair and study this out, because I'm not familiar with all these other verses, go to my playlist, what is the state of the dead, go to the YouTube channel, uh, Rethinking Hell. There's resources that are there for you if you want to reconsider this. But the thing is, if someone says, uh, Luke, I think you're wrong on this, uh, I hope they can say also, it's okay, you don't have to agree on this, because I, I, I think they're wrong, and, and I'm not requiring that they agree with me. But right. what I have, I have reached the point where I'm thinking, how could they um, seem to have glee over the idea of God torturing people forever, uh, and, and seem to feel like that's something that they really can't live without if uh, they seem to be so disappointed if God's not going to torture people. And if anybody's going to be offended about either side of this doctrine, uh, I, I'm offended by the teaching that our loving God, Jesus Christ, is instituted a torture chamber for, for the lost people, and they're going to be tortured forever. I mean, that's an insult to the, to the Savior, Jesus, that I know and love. There's Catholic paintings in the medieval times of God, the Father, and Jesus, and all the saints looking down at people in hell like, e -e -e. there's paintings of it, of them enjoying the torments of others in hell from heaven. It's so sick to me. I mean, it, I, I don't get it at all. I, he, it says that God does not enjoy the perishing of the wicked. I don't know where they get this garbage from. But I'm with you. I don't understand why they want that to be true, you know, and I don't believe it because I don't want it to be true, because if the Bible clearly said it, I'd believe it. It's just it. Th there's so much um, artistic language and metaphoric language that people don't study what was being said in Hebrew at that time that were common slang. And and they don't look at these things and don't look at the original what it's translated from. And they don't look at the full council. Like you said, for every, for every verse, there's really only one, maybe two verses they could use. And I've already explained the one in Jude. Uh, it tells you what the eternal fire was that destroyed Sodom. It said that was a picture of the perishing of the wicked, that they would be destroyed by that kind of fire. So there's really only one verse they can use compared to 25 verses that say different. You know, so I, I'm with you. I don't understand it. And I, I said before, they used to sit and listen to all the joys of people being tormented. And you got all these false prophets claiming they had dreams or supernatural visits to hell where so-and-so celebrities being tortured. Michael Jackson's being forced to moonwalk in the flames. I mean, it's just stupid. People are going to hell for wearing makeup and not paying their credit card debt. I mean, you wouldn't believe the stuff they say. The demons are down there torturing people. It's just so unbiblical. And people eat this up. I've seen people thank them. Thank you. I'm really going to straighten up my life and get rid of the sin. So what is the message you brought? you got to be good to earn your salvation. And that's what they come up with. They don't ever come back with the true gospel. It's always, i got to straighten my act up so I don't go to hell. Yeah. And it's very unfortunate. Okay, let me read a little further, see what Jonathan Edwards, you know, he's All right. the greatest hellfire and brimstone preacher ever. This is how Jonathan Edwards uh, preaches. All the means that there are of sinners going out of the world 
are so in God's hands and so universally and absolutely subject to his power and determination that it does not depend at all the less on the mere will of God whether sinners shall at any moment go to hell than if means were never made use of or at all concerned in the case. I didn't really follow that sentence there, but what I did stand out to me was the word subject to his power and determination. So that's another uh, red flag here that tells me that Calvinism. he's Calvinist because Calvinism believe it's everything is determined and advanced by God. Uh, there's nothing you can do about it. He'll either make you a believer or make you not allow you to believe. And it, it's all determined and you can't change it. Uh, so uh, num I'm at point number eight now. It says natural men's prudence and care to preserve their own lives or the care of others to preserve them do not secure them a moment to this divine providence and universal experience do also bear testimony. There is clear evidence that men's own wisdom is no security to them from death, that if it were otherwise, we should see some difference between the wise and the politic men of the world and others with regard to their liableness to early and unexpected death. But how is it, in fact? Ecclesiastes uh, 11, is that, 16, that a one? 2, 2, 16, yeah. I think it is. Uh, how dieth the wise man, even as the fool? Uh, all wicked men's pains and contrivance, which they use to escape hell, while they continue to reject Christ and so remain wicked, do not secure them from hell one moment. Almost every natural man that hears of hell flatters himself that he shall escape it. He depends upon himself for his own security. He flatters himself in what he has done, in what he is now doing, or what he intends to do. Everyone lays, yeah, everyone lays out matters in his own mind how he shall avoid damnation and flatters himself that he contrives well for himself and that his schemes will not fail they hear indeed that there are but few saved and that the greater part of men that have died heretofore are gone to hell. But each one imagines that he lays out matters better for his own escape than others have done. He does not intend to come to that place of torment. He says within himself that he intends to take effectual care and to order matters so for himself as not to fail. But the foolish children of men miserably delude themselves in their own schemes and in confidence in their own strength and wisdom. They trust to nothing but a shadow. The greater part of those who heretofore have lived under the same means of grace are, and are now dead are undoubtedly gone to hell. And it was not because they were not as wise as those uh, those who are now alive, it was not because they did not lay out matters as well for themselves to secure their own escape. If we could speak with them and inquire of them one by one whether they expected when alive and when they used to hear about hell ever to be the subject of that misery, we doubtless should hear one and another reply, quote, no, I never intended to come here. I had laid out matters otherwise in my mind. I thought I could, could should contrive well for myself. I thought my scheme good. I intended to take effectual care, but it came upon me unexpected. I did not look at it at that time, and in that manner, it came as a thief. Death outwitted me. God's wrath was too quick for me. Oh, my cursed foolishness, I was flattering myself and pleasing myself with vain dreams of what I would do hereafter. And when I was saying peace and safety, then suddenly destruction came upon me. Well, well, well he really twisted that verse. Yeah. That peace and safety is about the last days during the Antichrist reign, you know. But, hey, the one thing he did say, right, was that they reject Christ. So he hasn't given us any any hope for what can prevent this except he did say it's for those who reject christ so uh at least he's not saying it's just about their behavior and their lifestyle but that's the only place he's even alluded to christ saving us from this terrible thing and that at any moment god can snatch you 
and throw you in hell and there's nothing your scheming can do to keep you out of it. You know, you can't prolong your life. You can't avoid it. So you better, hopefully he's saying get saved today. Today is the day of salvation, right? It sounds like that would be where he's going, but I've yet to hear any solution to this terrible problem that we're all hanging over hell and that string can break any second, Luke. We could fall right into the burning fires of hell and torment. So where's the solution? Haven't heard it yet. All I've heard is that people are wicked. They're scheming. They do everything in their power to not go to hell. They think they're going to uh, have a long life, but at any moment, they're hanging over hell and they could fall in. It's only by God's divine mercy that they're not falling into the fires of hell and uh, for rejecting Christ. That's the only thing he said so far that I can actually agree with is for rejecting Christ. But he hasn't given us a solution to any of this terrible problem. Yeah, the uh, uh, that portion that I just read, except for the fear of the, the hell, the, the torture and torment in hell, as I've stated before, I don't think that is correct. But the, the premise that all of man's schemes and designs are not the solution. Uh, that, uh, you know, it's, it's true. And I wouldn't uh, argue with that. But I also was thinking, as you did, that what has taken him so long, uh, does he... he uh, I, I remember when I was um, studying that way of the master and uh, that that program, uh, they they took the idea from somebody, one of these uh, old preachers like uh, this guy, uh, Jonathan Edwards. And uh, they, the, when you're preaching, it should be like 90 percent law and then only 10 percent grace. You, you just have to just overwhelm them with law and, 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 and hell and all this before before you you even give them a clue that hey God's grace is is offered to you salvation's offered you as a free gift it's taken him a long time to even um, it hasn't even been mentioned yet uh, except he did say something about uh, accepting Christ I think but uh, um, yeah I, I I certainly would not uh, take that much time uh, emphasizing these points and waiting and delaying uh, to, to get to uh, the, the good news. There's no, he hasn't yeah. explained the good news yet, has he? No, he hasn't told us anything except we're all dangling over the fires of hell. And at any moment, God can choose to cut that string. Yeah. And I'm, of course, as everybody uh, is probably very curious to when he does tell us the, uh, the gospel, the, the good news, how is he going to present that? Is it going to be as, as we understand it from the Bible, that it's pure uh, for, uh, grace, unadulterated grace, uh, free yeah. gift salvation without any religious works, uh, without any repentance of sin, uh, change of life that's required? Or is he going to preach, uh, change your life, get sin out of your life in addition Let's see honest. what he says here. Yeah, okay, I go mean, ahead. Uh, you continue. All right, we start at 10. Let me get down the page here. God has laid himself under no obligation by any promise to keep natural man out of hell one moment. God certainly has made no promises either of eternal life or of any deliverance or preservation from eternal death, but what are contained in the covenant of grace, okay, the promises that are given in Christ, and whom all the promises are yea and amen. Okay, here comes the but. But surely they have no interests in the promise, promises and have no interest in the mediator of the covenant. So that whatever some have imagined and pretend about promises made to natural men's earnest seeking and knocking. Again, now he's turned it back to us seeking God. But it says there's none that seeketh after God. That actually God uh, has to open our minds. It is plain and manifest that whatever pains a natural man takes in religion, whatever prayers he makes till he believes in Christ. Hold on. He's getting there. He's starting to sound okay. God is under no, unless he believes in Christ, God is under no manner of obligation to keep him a moment from eternal destruction. That's true. So that, thus it is the natural men are held in the hand of God over the pit of hell. They have deserved the fiery pit and are already sentenced to it. And God is dreadfully provoked. His anger is as great towards them as to those that are actually suffering the executions of the fierceness of his wrath and hell executions 
where they're being tormented again. And they have done nothing in the least to appease or abate that anger. Neither is God in the least bound by any promise to hold them up one moment. The devil is waiting for them. Hell is gaping for them. The flames gather and flash about them and would fain lay hold to any man. Hold on. Page did it again. Lay hold on them and swallow them up. The fire pent up in their own hearts is struggling to break out and they have no interest in the mediator. There are no means within uh, reach that can be any security to them. In short, they have no refuge, nothing to take hold of. All that preserves them every moment is the mere arbitrary will, uncovenanted, unobliged forbearance of an incensed God. Wow. Wow. Huh. Uh, do you want me to continue? Oh, well, I'd just say that when he says all that's preventing it is God's forbearance. Uh, uh, well, I, I guess you could say God's forbearing, letting them live uh, and giving them more time to, to, uh, to come to faith. Right. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we agree that, uh, yeah, everybody has a death sentence on them. Everybody is condemned. Yeah. Uh, unless you believe in Jesus, then you're no longer condemned. So th the premise there is all, all true. But, uh, again, he's uh, uh, saying that the only thing that's preventing is just God's forbearance. Well, I could say that true as far as applying God could cause us to die any moment. And then once you die... There's no second chance after you die. I mean, right. uh, we, we understand that uh, uh, you, and, until your last breath, there is uh, an opportunity it. for you to believe and, and get saved. But once you breathe your last breath, then there's no chance after that. Right. So and that's good. Uh, yeah, you. Yeah. Okay. I go mean, ahead. he mentions grace, and he believe he mentions believing. So. Yeah. He has done that. He says the use of this awful subject may be for awakening unconverted persons in this con congregation. Hmm. This that you have heard is the case of every one of you that are out of Christ. Uh huh. Wait a minute. Now, is he saying that you could, because if they were, it's unlikely they'd be going to the congregation if they never believed on Jesus. So is he saying you can take yourself out of Christ? This that you have heard is the case of every one of you that are out of Christ. That world of misery, that lake of burning brimstone is extended abroad under you. There is the dreadful pit of the glowing. I'm so sorry, this keeps happening. The glowing flames of the wrath of God. There is hell's wide gaping mouth and you have nothing to stand upon nor anything to take hold of. There is nothing between you and hell but the air. It is only the power and mere pleasure of God that holds you up. You are probably not sensible of this. You find that you are kept out of hell, but do not see the hand of God in it. But look at other things as the good state of your bodily constitution, your care of your own life, and the means you use for your own preservation. But indeed, these things are nothing. If God should withdraw his ban, they would avail no more to keep you from falling. And the thin air to hold you up over a person that is suspended in it. Your weakness makes you, as it were, heavy as lead, and to tend downwards with great weight and pressure towards hell. And if God should let you go, you would immediately sink and swiftly descend and plunge into the bottomless gulf. And your healthy constitution and your own care and prudence and best contrivance and all your righteousnesses would have no more influence to hold you and keep you out of hell than a spider's web would have to stop a falling rock. Were it not for the sovereign pleasure of God, the earth would not bear you one moment for you are a burden in it. Hold on. A burden to it. The creature creation groans for you with you. The creature is made subject to the bondage of your corruption. Not willingly. The sun does not willingly shine upon you to give you light to serve sin and Satan. The earth does not willingly yield her increase to you to satisfy your lust, nor is it willingly a stage for your wickedness to be acted upon. The air does not willingly serve you for breath to maintain the flame of life in your vitals while you spend your life in the service of God's enemies. You want me to keep going or, go, or stop? Uh, well, yeah, okay. We'll stop for a moment, I guess. Uh, again, you know, what, what really strikes me here, I mean, one of the reasons that this sermon is so powerful and so famous 
uh, I can see is because his, of his oratory. And yeah. He really is brilliant. At, at any the, minute, at, any minute, at, you can drop into hell. There's no guarantee you don't drop in hell right now. But he's oh, not yeah. telling them how to be saved, how to avoid it. Yeah. I mean, he has mentioned believing, but when he said for those in this congregation who are out of Christ, so does he believe you can believe and because you're not living your faith that you're out of Christ? Is that what he's implying? Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know. Maybe he's, he could be assuming that within the audience, uh, there are some people that have are, are not Christians, are not saved. And maybe that's what he means. Or maybe he means that uh, you're not in Christ because you're backslidden and now you've lost your salvation. I, that's I don't what I'm really, worried about. I'm yeah. worried that he's saying that it's something you're, you've done. He doesn't, yeah. uh, the world doesn't exist for you to serve Satan and to sin. He, he, you're, the world exists so you can serve God and live right. And that yeah. seems to be where he's going with this. Well, I can, I can see why he's such a renowned, famous uh, 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 preacher. And this sermon is such a famous sermon because uh, the, uh, his use of language, I, I can imagine hearing him deliver it was probably uh, oh, yeah. a very, very good speaker and uh, dramatic. Can't uh, you hear the voice rising and lowering? <laughs> Can't yeah. you hear you know, like the good old uh, uh, Pentecostal preachers of the old days? Can't you just hear him with the, you know, the rising and falling dra dramatics? Yeah, uh, it just it, it saddens me that uh, again I might be jumped to a conclusion. But I'm I'm really anxious to find out when he does get to the solution because he's only telling warning people and scaring them so far. But if he does get to a point where he actually explains the answer to their problem, uh, what will he say the answer is? That's what I'm curious about. But go, go ahead. Why don't you continue? Okay. Oh, uh, we're getting close to the ninety minutes too. As yeah. But, uh, all right, I got, the, I got the camera off for a second. Um, let's see. I don't know exactly where I stopped. Why don't you read? Okay, I'll read a little portion here. Okay, it says, I'm at, God's creatures are good. That's where you stop, you stop, okay? God's creatures are good and were made for men to serve God with and do not willingly sub subserve to any other purpose and groan when they are abused to purposes so directly contrary to their nature and end and the world would spew you out were you not for the sovereign hand of him who hath subjected it in hope there are black clouds of God's wrath now hanging directly over your heads full of the dreadful storm and big with thunder, and were it not for the restraining hand of God, it would immediately burst forth upon you the sovereign pleasure of God, for the present stays his rough wind. Otherwise, it would come with fury, and your destruction would come like a whirlwind, and you would be like the chaff of the summer threshing floor. The wrath of God is like great waters that are dammed for the present, they increase more and more and rise higher and higher till an outlet is given. And the longer the stream is stopped, the more rapid and mighty is its course. When once it is let loose, it is true that judgment against your evil works has not been executed hitherto. The floods of God's vengeance have been withheld, but your Guilt in the meantime is constantly increasing, and you are every day treasuring up more wrath. The waters are constantly rising and waxing more and more mighty, and there is nothing but the mere pleasure of God that holds the waters back. That are unwilling to be stopped and press hard to go forward. If God should only withdraw his hand from the floodgate, it would immediately fly open, and the fiery floods of the fears of God rush forth with inconceivable fury and would come upon you with omnipotent power and if your strength were 10,000 times greater than it is yea 10,000 times greater than the strength of the stoutest sturdiest devil in hell it would be nothing to withstand or endure it the bow of God's wrath is bent and the arrow made ready on the string and justice 
bends the arrow at your heart and strains the bow. And it is nothing but the mere pleasure of God and that of an angry God without any promise or obligation at all that keeps the arrow at one moment from being made drunk with your blood. Thus, all you that never passed a great change of heart uh -oh, by the mighty power of the Spirit of God upon your souls, all you, you that were never born again and made new creatures and raised from being dead in sin to a state of new and there before altogether experienced light and life are in the hands of an angry God. However, you may be reformed in your life in many things and may have had religious affections. Well, let me stop there. I'm going to let me uh, stop. We'll start with however uh, next time. Um, let me mark this point here. Hey, Luke, there is a gentleman that's been coming a while with verses uh, that he thinks are saying something or not. And this is the perfect time with what we're discussing to answer one of these verses in the chat room. May I do that? Uh, yes, please do. Okay. Seeking truth. You wrote, if the righteous scarcely be saved, what about, let me see, I'll find the verse. What about those that aren't or something like that? Um, I pulled the verse up. It is in first Peter. Now, when we see something about being saved, we have to look to whom is it written and uh, about what, what are they being saved from? Not every salvation or saved is from eternal damnation. You can be saved from man's judgment. You can be saved from the consequence of sin. You can be saved from uh, earthly chastisement and earthly consequences for that sin and earthly wrath, all right? So let's look at it. He's telling them that if you're gonna suffer, suffer for Christ's sake, not because of some terrible sin. Okay, now he says, let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer or as a busybody in other men's matters. So he's telling these people how they should be living, okay? Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, so he's talking to Christians here, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. So this is about being saved from the consequences of sin. Because if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Well, there is none righteous by their works. So if the righteous, they must be, uh, they must have God's righteousness imputed on them. God wouldn't call them righteous unless they had his righteousness. Because our righteousness serves filthy rags. So our works don't make us righteous enough. All right. So if you're called righteous, it's because you're in right standing with God. So if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Wherefore, let them suffer according to the will of God. So it's about being saved from the suffering that comes from being a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or a busybody. But if you're going to suffer, suffer as a Christian for Christ's glory. Okay, so now are you seeing it? It has nothing to do with your works keep keeping you saved or not being saved because of how you're living. It's about being saved from the consequences. If you're going to suffer, suffer for Christ's sake. Don't suffer as a murderer or a thief or a busybody or an evildoer. Because if the righteous scarcely be saved, you know, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? So you have to read these things in context. This is not saying that uh, what you think it's saying. Anyway, I know what you think it's saying. Did that make sense? Luke? Well, I, I hope that made, made sense to the person who uh, you, you were addressing it to. Uh, the uh, um, I, I want to say this to everybody. Uh, many of you uh, watching and in the chat room, uh, you're, you're part of our regular congregation and you're familiar with uh, uh, the, the message that we've been teaching and defending for a long time. Uh, you don't really need to be instructed necessarily on all, all these uh, basic core doctrines. Um, Jesus is eternal, God Almighty. Uh, salvation is not earned through religious works of ours. It's received as a free gift from Jesus. When we believe that Jesus succeeded in paying for our sins on the cross, 
and that we are going to go to heaven and we have eternal life because Jesus promised it to us and that that's guaranteed it's certain uh, when we understand and believe believe that uh, then uh, that's the that's the key to under and, and that's what you test everything else against once you understand that then you can listen to a sermon like this and you can see what's right and what's wrong with it um, but the point I'm getting at is if you're new here thank you for joining us and I hope you, that this is a blessing to you and you'll continue in the congregation but I, if you're new here, you may not be aware that I believe the best resource I've seen on, on YouTube uh, to answer verses, if you would say, Here, well, what about this verse? Well, what about that verse? You know, these are what were called problem verses or problem texts. It's saying, well, you believe that salvation is simply faith alone? Uh, well, what about this verse? And what, well, what, Sister Renee has done a better job than anybody I know on YouTube uh without any fear of any verse uh, she takes on all the verses so go to her channel and look through all her videos and all the problem verses that you've ever dreamed about saying well this is this proves them wrong this proves them wrong she has taken the time she's been devoted to the cause of addressing the problem verses and explaining them and teaching you to understand it correctly so um yeah she just did it right now because that's her that's her calling and she's going to drop everything. Anytime she'll drop everything to help someone understand a problem verse. And so I'm not surprised that she wanted to do that now. But go to her channel, and it'll be a great uh, help to everybody. Uh, now, before we're, we're finished, uh, I know that we agreed to go for 90 minutes and because it's late back in the East Coast. Um, but do you want to give everybody a chance just to see if there's any final question that they want to post real quick? Or are you, are you anxious to, to close it off? sister or not um no i i would like to mention what uh rl said here he said if any person acted like this imaginary creature edwards is idolatrously calling god that person would be segregated from all society for the good of society yeah the god he's preaching is unless he comes around with some real good news i i don't know i mean I, this is crazy, you know, how he, he hasn't even gotten to how you can avoid it. All he's mentioned is there is grace, which I see none of it here. And there and it's about believing on Christ. But he hasn't. He also implied that you can be out of Christ because these people are in the church. And you know how strict they were back then. So I can't imagine them not believing as Puritans. So um, I don't know. I'm, I'm interested to see where he goes with it. But thanks, you guys. And Seeking Truth, I'll do a video on that verse so you can check it out. And I'll explain it again, why it doesn't mean what you think it means. I've seen you come in a lot, you know, with that stuff. And I don't know if you're trying to refute just trusting in Christ as enough or if you are truly confused. And in any case, I will answer it. Because I want everybody saved and resting in Christ. And you're trusting either in what Jesus did already, which is the gospel, or you're trusting in what you do. There is no mixture. Because if you add works, it's no longer grace. Can't be both. So I'll do that for you in a minute. But thanks for having me, Brother Luke. This is uh, quite a change from the warrant of faith, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, yes, it, it is. And uh, the point that you made there uh, is I'll, I'll expound on that just a, a little bit more is that um we've we've read large portions because we want uh, i believe that you need the continuity of his thought uh so he's he's brilliant at communicating he's probably an uh, expert at delivering it uh but all of this is like 99.9 percent .9 of everything he's saying is God wants to torture you, you know, yeah. and the only thing that's holding you back is he drop you anytime into yep. torture. And here we go in this for an hour and a half, uh, listening to it, analyzing it. And I would say that even if at some point he actually presents the gospel the way we know the gospel is, without any religious works or, or, uh, or repentance of sins or change life that's required of us, even if he does present it and he gets that right at some point, he's already done so much damage by turning people against God, just as R.L. Yeah. said here. 
Thank you. you know, any person that, that listens to this, they're going to be turned against God. They're saying, this doesn't sound like a, love, a God that's love. This right. sounds like some evil, sadistic, cruel uh, entity, you know? Yep. So uh, at some point, I don't know how he can even, if he presents the gospel correctly in the end, which I'm skeptical about. Me too. But if he does... He's probably already poisoned the water so much that they've already t turned everybody against this type right. of God. Right. Okay. Uh, all right. So I've marked the point for, for us to continue next time. Okay. But, uh, so uh, let me. Thank let, you, guys. Yeah. Uh, to the chat room, everybody, uh, thank you for participating. And uh, uh, I'll. I'll you know, probably tomorrow I'll go through, scroll through all the ch chat comments more carefully and see if there's something to respond to. Sister, there, there was very near the end here. There was someone, I think it was Hendrix. He asked if you could make a video about Titus something. Uh, do you see that? Uh, no, I didn't. You might, you might want to save that because he's, he's requested a particular answer. It's, it's Hendrix. And let me see. I tried to copy it. Hey, Hendrix, uh, I'm going to upload a video for uh, uh, Seeking Truth on First Peter 4. Put that request on a comment there, and I'll do it right after. Titus, Titus 1.16, I think. Is okay. Yeah, let me look again. Titus, yeah, Titus 1.16 is what he wants you to, to uh, make a video about. Okay? Okay. All, all right. right. So I'll leave that to you because you have a great gift for answering all those problem verses. Thank so, you. No uh, problem. To, to all to all the saints, uh, thanks for being with us, and and uh, sister, uh, it's always a great pleasure to talk about Jesus in the Bible with you. And even when we're hearing studying something that kind of makes me uh, upset because uh, because I think he's emphasizing the wrong thing, uh, yeah. it's still it's still a pleasure to have fellowship with you. So thank you. And thank uh, by the way, uh, if anybody's watching now. And you're not uh, aware that we also have a Sunday service for the Church of the Eternally Secure. It's on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. It starts at 2 p.m. Pacific time. That's 5 p.m. Eastern time every Sunday. So please join us in that congregation, and uh, maybe we can we can uh, serve as your uh, live internet church service too. So thank you, everybody. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus.